the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're profiling actress Musetta Vander and artist Astrid Preston. Astrid's work is on the set today, and it looks fabulous. Uh, Musetta Vander was born in South Africa, where she worked as a music VJ, a model, a dancer, an actress. <laughs> she did everything. We know Musetta is the soprano who brings so much life to the opera La Boheme. But what similarities does this Musetta have to her? Wow, um, I guess the biggest similarity is my mother. She sang in the opera, and that's how I ended up with the name. But I, I didn't inherit the voice. Um, you didn't? <laughs> um, I I got the dance part because she was a ballet teacher, so um, she trained me since I was able to stand up straight to dance. So that's Did you dance professionally? Yes, I did. I did. I'm also a qualified ballet teacher, so, but I danced professionally. I didn't really teach. I used to teach out, you know, help out a little bit here and there and teach for people, but I always pursued dancing, you know, as an art. Do you still take dance class? I still take dance class, yes. I don't uh, dance professionally anymore, no. Are you still modeling professionally? No, I do it. That's my hobby <laughs> now. I focus mainly on acting. Yes. You do. Now, when um, Puccini's Musetta was filled with life and fate came her way. I think fate has uh, kind of pointed its finger at you too in your career. Yes, it, it definitely has. I, I very much believe in fate. I believe you just, you know, end up where you're meant to end up. And um, the whole way I met my husband and ended up here and... Um, How did you end up here? How did you end up in America um, from South Africa? I always think that's the furthest place in the world. It was. It was, <laughs> it was quite an experience. Um, I had a show in South Africa, like, um, you know, MTV show and my husband just by chance one day put on the TV in the hotel room and the same night we bumped into each other at the opening of a, um, a nightclub because I had in to go where? in South Africa to represent the show uh, just by pure fluke and um, one thing led to another and before I knew it here I was in America you know is that how you got yes. here? You came with us? Oh, yes he brought oh. me over we met <laughs> and we, we you know it was were you did you think you were going to be an actress at that point Yes, I was just starting to branch into that um, over there. I'd just uh, done a film and um, I was into my second one and then I met him and you know, it was just a natural progression. I think if you start out in a family in the arts, it's just one thing leads to the other and you end up sooner or later in front of a camera acting. <laughs> you, can't, you had that in your background, but what did you do once you got to America to, to pursue your career? Did you take acting lessons here? Or? Yes, I did. I took acting lessons here. I, I studied really hard with m various different teachers and um, I got myself agents, you know, and... But was it easy here? I think it seems like it would be very difficult for a, f a foreigner. I hate to say a foreigner, it's but you were a foreigner. Yes, I still am, I guess. <laughs> I, I, it is, it, well, I was lucky, you know. I think luck has a lot to do with everything. I think there's a lot of very talented people out there who just never get the opportunity. It's just luck, you know, being at the right place at the right time. Uh, I just naturally fell into, I first did music videos. From that, I ended up going into, um, you know, I did commercials. I ended up Here in a film. In America. Yes, I ended up being in music videos for the guys I used to host on my show in South Africa. Like what kind of names? I Big Rod names. Rod Stewart. Uh, Tina Turner, Elton John, Paul Carrick. You were in their videos here. Yes, which is very <laughs> funny. I, I, I was sitting there going, this is really strange. Here I am on, on, on their music videos. And um, it was great. I, it was wonderful. And, um, you know, it's just... You know, auditioning, got the job and um, got movies, series, and then, you know, one thing leads to another. It's just luck. One of the things, I know you did a film, um, Monolith. Yes. And we have a clip from that. So yes. let's l show a little bit of your acting ability okay. and then we'll talk about it a little yes, bit more. Yes, Okay. Okay. What'd you tell them? Hmm? What? What? Hmm? What'd you uh, tell them? 
What'd you tell the cops? Uh, What'd you tell I the wish to speak to my embassy. What? I can't hear you. Huh? What did you tell the girl? I bet you told the girl something. Did you tell I the guy? I wish to speak to my embassy. You're not going to be able to talk to us. us! Tell us the truth. Did you tell the cops? I am here in spirit of cooperation. No, you want to cooperate? I demand to speak to my embassy. You have no right to keep me here. It's out of control because of you, Katya. You hadn't pursued the boy, and we could have contained it. Tislovich! I thought there was a chance to save Piri. This is like real science fiction. Were you being tortured? <laughs> well, not really, but uh, you know, I, I don't. I say to the guys, listen, just grab my hair, yank it. I don't care, you know. Who else was in that film? Um, John Hurt, Lou Gossett Jr., Bill Paxton, Lindsay Frost. Um, you know, those were the, the main stars of the film. Uh, many other actors, um, but I mainly worked with those people, you know, in, in that particular film. We, we were um, brought together by Michael Roche, yes. who is a costumer for films, and he has a magazine called Chatter as yes. well, which uh, featured you in one of the issues. And he said that any time you made a film, he requested to be on, on camera with you and to do your costumes. What well, so is so particularly great about doing your... I, what does he like? Does he like the way the clothes hang on you or the look or... Well, I, 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 I guess. I don't know. I, he, you know, he's a very nice person. We get on very well together. I think it's very important if you work with somebody to like a person, you know, because you're going to be working for, together for a long time and you have to, like, you know, be understand them and have some rapport so you can say, listen, I don't think this works. Let's get this outfit or whatever. Can you have some input into the way your costuming looks? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. If you don't feel comfortable in it, it'll show, you know, so get it as best you can and go wild. Well, Michael also, uh, Michael worked on the film of Oblivion yes. with you, and mm -hmm. we have a clip from that yes, as well. You do you want to tell us just a little bit about it? Because you look really tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, Oblivion is a, a sci-fi western. It takes place in the future. I play a character called Lash, who's an outlaw. She's wild. She's over the top. She's outrageous. She's into power, and men and women are just her playthings. You know, she just will do anything to get ahead and um, well you'll see from the clip. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Not so fast, Pocahontas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you could join us. <laughs> we couldn't bear to leave you behind, Princess. We like you too much. <laughs> wow, you really look tough in that. Did you learn how to use a whip? Yes, yes, I did. Um, Ed Douglas um, taught me to uh, use the whip. He was um, he helped Michelle Pfeiffer with her whip for Batman. Oh, and um, you know him and his partner. And um, I had very brief training with him before he left, and he's the nicest guy. He trained me all the time as much as he could, and um, it was difficult in the did beginning. Did you hurt that person? <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny story. One, one take we did, I had to run with the whip, and it's eight foot um, whip. You know, it's very long, especially when you put your arm out. It makes it even longer. So I had to plan it so that the timing was in, when we run that I stop in time so that I can wrap him with the whip. And I had to release the whip before I got to him. But as I was running, the end of the whip <laughs> has got the little fringe that hangs like that hooked onto my finger, and I hit him full on his back with a double <laughs> looped whip. <laughs> so I think that expression they used there was the actual reaction. Was from that <laughs> when when I hit him full in the middle of his back, he was not happy. It was very funny. Did you just do one take? <laughs> no, we did several. No, did I, didn't, you? I didn't ever. That's the only time I ever hit anybody with the whip. Well, it wasn't the end. It's the end that gets you because the end, you know, is the thing that makes the crack. And <sighs> if that thing tips you, I mean, you know, you so cut the sound barrier. So he trained you how to do it the right way. 
Yes, he was wonderful. He was wonderful. You didn't use a double. Somebody else no, didn't no, do it. No, no, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to learn to use the whip and all that What stuff. kind of roles um, do you see yourself playing? Um, I'm getting ready to do a, a, a project um, in which um, I will play a scientist. Uh, and then uh, shortly after that, I'm playing a news reporter in, a, in another project called Under the Hula Moon. Do you, do you think of yourself in certain roles? Do you think of yourself as a glamour girl? Would you be a glamour girl? Well, you know, I believe people can do anything. You can do anything as long as you believe you can. And um, I think I don't want to limit and say, yeah, I'll be a glamour girl. No, right. you know, anything. I, I like things that are gritty and unusual to Sense. do <laughs> and have, you know, that's a challenge. Now, what know? about the accent? Is the accent harmful or is it beneficial in your work? It's a, that's an interesting thing because, yes, sometimes, well, it's not really harmful because I do many different accents, you oh, know, you I, I was Russian and monolith and oblivion, I did my own accent. I do all different types of accents depending on what the part requires. Can you speak American? Yes. Accent? Yes, I work on that. That's very hard, but, you know, I have to work with a coach on it. I prepare for the I part see. and stuff like that. It's not something I just switch into, like, you know. So it wouldn't keep you from taking a part? No, but I, you, no, it wouldn't. No, absolutely not. You know, uh, I... I but I like having my own accent. I try, <laughs> you know, as much as I can to keep my own accent through a film because um, I think it's unusual and, you know, I don't know, it's my accent. <laughs> it's me. You worked with Barry Bostwick yes, on I a did. film. It, was it singing and dancing involved? Because he is a great singer and dancer. Yes, I, I saw him in the Rocky Horror Picture Show and I was like, wow. <laughs> but um, uh, no, there was no singing and dancing involved at all. It was action, you know, um, sci-fi thriller and um, it was just straightforward you know acting drama did you, when you modeled mm -hmm. did you uh, work with uh, the coutures did you do uh, runway I I, um, I did runway I did you know more uh, print and, and stuff like that but um, I've always been you see I've Always, I was dancing for a very long time professionally, so to do the dancing and the commercials and the acting, modeling and, and anything else kind of took a sidestep because mm. I, I would like the physical arts much more than, than you know, the, the glamorous part, although I enjoyed it. I mean, you know, modeling, I don't knock it at all. I think if you make a lot of money, it's great, <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> but it's not the same as acting. Did you have any favorite designers? Do you have any favorite designers? <sighs> No, no. My mood changes like this, you and, know. And what about uh, hanging out in Los Angeles? Do you have certain places you like to go? In Los Angeles? I am a homebody, I have to admit. <laughs> you know, I like doing the normal things. I like staying at home. Um, I go out, I go see a lot of movies. Um, I like traveling a lot. So any opportunity I get, I go away. You know, even if it's just for the weekend, I, you know, we get on the car, we go to the mountains or, you know, we go to the beach and take the dogs for a hike in the mountains and just relax, you know, and get away from it all. That's, that's, I think, very important. Uh, you know, otherwise it just gets too crazy. Well, we're so happy that you were with us today because I think you brought a whole new kind of light into our eyes. <laughs> this oh. wonderful person who just arrived here and took Hollywood by storm. Well, gee, well, thank you. So, Musetta, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And don't go away because Astrid Preston will be back with us in just after the break. I'm Joan Quinn and we're back with artist Astrid Preston. Astrid was born in Stockholm, Sweden and came to Los Angeles at the age of six. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree from UCLA and lives in Santa Monica. She's had her work shown all over the United States since the 1970s when she was represented by New Space Gallery. Her work has been exhibited in galleries and museums across America, just as I said, and she's gotten a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship grant in painting. That was in 1987. Did you always want to be an artist, Astrid? I did, actually, from when I was, oh, I think about seven. Is that right? Yeah. I once did something that I thought was wonderful. 
you know, it was just a kid's painting, but it was so exciting to me that I decided that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. But did you, your parents were architects. Was that an influence on you in any way? Well, when I was small, my father always, no matter where we went, he would make drawings. He brought a sketch pad with him. Mm -hmm. So he's been an avid drawer, and my mother does ceramics oh, together so with the architecture. You were around it a mm -hmm. lot then. Yeah, and they had a lot of friends who were artists, but they always said, you know, don't do it as a profession, you know, you have to study something else. Well, what did you study then when you went to UCLA? You didn't study art, did I you? I didn't study art, no. <laughs> no, I listened to my parents. I started in math, so I was a math major for a year, and I wasn't, you know, cut out to do that. And then I studied English literature. And that's what you graduated with a degree in mm -hmm, English literature? Yeah. I was taking art classes on the side and draw, doing a lot of figure drawing. When did this your career actually blossom then? How did uh, well, the gallery got, thing come about? When I got out of school, I traveled a little bit in Europe and um, you know, and I decided I could pursue that, you know, as as a career. It's sort of a big shift to do it for fun and then to take it seriously. And I, I just drew all the time, and I took the drawings around, and I met Joni Gordon, who was just starting New Space. I see. What were you? What material were you using? I was at that time. I was drawing with a silver point pencil on clay coated paper. It was very, very delicate. A real delicate surface. Is it clay coated white? It's or what clay color? colored. It's like a creamy a color, creamy? and the silver would scratch onto it, sort of like lead. You leave uh -huh. lead, but you left silver on and scratched off the clay. And were they landscapes? It was really smooth. Were they landscapes at that time? They were almost like surfaces of the body, organic sh surfaces of the moon. It was very really? sort of ambiguous. Did you Light ever shadow. Uh, uh, draw representational, like straight? Well, I was taking, doing figure drawing on the side. Were you? Yeah, and doing some of that. But at that point, I had sort of studied William Blake in college, and he influenced some of the early drawings, and they were very stylized figures, you know, very heroic. Then how did you move out of that and become a landscape painter? Are you a landscape painter? <laughs> oh. Is that the wrong thing to say? No, I'm not a landscape painter, but I do, it is one of my favorite images to use because I think all art comes from nature and so I do like I've been doing some portraits recently and well apples are still part of nature we have that here is this but, you call this a portrait rather than it's almost it's closer you know uh, well I do port I've done some self portraits and portraits of other people too recently and chairs and furniture which uh, to me relates to people so those are the more th more that's rep yours that's it's all of it but you know but landscape I th for me has is, I can do the most with it do I, you how do you do you paint just from from going out into the landscape because this doesn't look like anything that we would have seen no I this hate painting. painting outdoors just the opposite of my father who likes to go out and sketch you know, I go out, I take photographs, I'll make some sketches, but I'm somehow I'm impatient when I'm outside. I'm very distracted by, by the elements. And so explain this then. How would you start something like this? Ah, at this point I was doing a lot of paintings dealing with opposites. And um, so this one, less than others were, that would actually be, you can sort of see sort of daytime. And it, the, whole, the one painting would have, go from night to day oh, oh. and it'd be strange light sources. And but do you make these light sources up if you hate to be outside? Well, or have I, you gone out on, and seen them and then On this back? one, I did take a photograph of like a house up in Brentwood that had some of the light on the walls like that. Mm -hmm. And then I simplified the house. And then this I created for drama and for to pull the eye in. And so I usually make them up, but I, I construct them. I put things together from different photos I've taken oh, or found, images I've found in magazines. Put, you, do you make an actual drawing with these images before? I and used then to doodle them. Now I just sort of construct it in my head. Oh, you do? And then I'll just go straight on and like, like and, the and little ones I'm doing now, I'll just go and paint it right on. Tell us this again. What kind of material is it? It's canvas, I know. Yeah. No, everything I've been doing is oil on it's canvas. It's all oil? Yeah. And it takes lots of layers of paint to build up the surface. A lot of underpainting. But it doesn't even look like it's built up. It looks very flat. Oh, because I paint very thin. So I do thin, thin layers of glaze. and So, you know, anything might have 10 coats of paint, but they're quite thin. Is that right? Yeah. And this, how, how would that, I mean, that is very, very delicate next to you. And there's so much going on, and it's so tiny. What, right. what size is it? 
It's uh, four inches by six inches, the same <laughs> size as a postcard. Oh, it is? <laughs> yeah, so I, originally I started doing these very small paintings to give for, to friends as presents and for traveling. I had a friend who was doing a lot of traveling, and I made a really small three by four inch little painting. To take with her? To take with her. It's so fabulous to put it in your hotel room or have yeah, something beautiful have something. like that. And then I started just loving working small. I could do, I can work a little faster small. It doesn't, time-wise. I can work on several things at once. The, the thing with small um, as opposed to large or as opposed to museum quality work, are small paintings as important in the fine art world? Um, I think they are. But of course, big is catchier. Is that the difference? But I mean, but how do people, how do museums look at uh, s small pieces? Um, it's like I was thinking, Mark Inners does small paintings, and they're in the collection at MOCA, and they'll put them out. And um, I'm not sure at the county museum. They'll have, you know, certainly this size, like the apples. Uh huh. But this small. This is very small. I don't know. We have another small one. I don't know. It's funny because any of these paintings, I like working large also, but I can't bring those into your studio. How large do you work? Six by eight feet. Oh, you do? Yeah, and I these same paintings, you know, I try to make the composition so tight that this painting could be, you know, when you're looking at it, you can get lost in it and hopefully it can be a whole world. I could make it that big. Now explain this. This one? Uh-huh. Oh, that's a total made-up painting. <laughs> they, they all are composite. Um, what do you want me to say? Just tell us about it. It's just the landscape that you've concocted yourself? Well, I, I use several images. This Different was much colors. more of a, yeah, the gold, and I want to have some gold in the sky and the fields. I wanted the, I made them much more like in England. So I started off with sort of an English landscape from some of the travels I've done around sort of southwest England. And then I created a foreground space with Did the trees and all the bushes, which I only was working on two days ago. <laughs> it's already dry. <laughs> it's the same size as the postcard one. Yeah, because I have a show up right now, so all my work I sent down to Laguna Beach. What, what about so. um, philosophy and artists? Have, have you been influenced by other artists through the years? I have. I have. Um, but the people, it's funny though, when I work, because I go straight to nature, so you don't need an artist? I, I, when I was first starting to work, I would look, a, I read a lot of art books and, you know, went to a lot of museums. And, um, you know, when I was a teenager, I, you know, I did my, my Picasso paintings and my Matisse paintings. And in the, I, I in the style of, is that what yeah, you mean? In I the did style my of? own, you know, I did a Chagall. I did quite, just to understand these artists, I would do a painting using, you know, some of their ideas. But what about, and the colors, would you emulate everything so that yeah, it was? Yeah, it was when I was young, when I was learning. Uh huh. I would copy it all, but not the exact picture. I always changed things. And then as you progressed, did any of these things stay with you from any of uh, I, those artists? I don't know. It's hard to know what stays. <laughs> Is know, it? You can't say. Probably if I really thought about it, but usually it's the people I, I'm drawn to. You know, I like Chinese painting a lot. And so I've tried to do pieces that have, don't have gravity in, in a uh, way and don't have horizon lines. And I've struggled for years doing that and I'm not always successful. I've done a few, but it's a very hard thing for me to do. It's much easier to do a... Is that even, a different... Uh, it's a different way of thinking. Even the apples were to deal with thinking? that. Yeah. So I was trying to, to have things hanging in space and not being grounded not always growing up. And so this piece grew out of that kind of thinking. Does that come from the philosophy of Chinese painting or, or It's more oriental? of a visual, it's a, it? an inner need. Yeah, there's always something inside that comes out, sort of a psychological need in me it, to, exp to express it. And then I'm drawn, you know, to Vermeer for his services and his light. I'm drawn to different painters. That's what I would think. That's what I was wondering, yeah. if there are certain elements from some of the masters yeah. that influence your I'd work? I'd say recently, I was in um, Venice and Florence last year and I went to see, I went to go see the Bellinis. You know, I, I thought he was just wonderful and I saw them, but then Montaigne, who, was, who turned me on. And so you can't say till you see somebody in person, oh, it's I like I went, oh, this is just wonderful. The Bellinis are large and... Some, uh, they're all different sizes. Yeah, and they weren't quite, I mean, there's only one or two I saw that were totally wonderful in person while every Montaigne was divine. 
and you don't know how divine a painting will be till you see it in person. You know, you can't know from a reproduction. Yeah, you, but but it seems like the movement of one maybe doesn't isn't moving you mm -hmm. the way. Um, yeah in person, what happens. Because I always think the Bellinis have so much movement and so much yeah. feeling about the people. And, and they didn't, and suddenly it's these very architectural things with people with the red angels. <laughs> and even though they were brother-in-laws and they both were painting red angels, they sort of painted them in different ways. Huh. That's what I thought about that. These, I almost put red angels in my paintings for a while. <laughs> but I had to, <laughs> it didn't but, work. But if it happened, then you would know kind of where it came that from. That one I would know where it came from. And so consciously I'll think of something and then I'll try and I'll say, this is, you know, it was just a whim. But I was at the time, see, painting some furniture that was floating and um, chairs. Uh, I did a red bed, and so I think I was very attracted to red, and so to have these red angels floating in space. Now, after um, you painted for a long time, and then you had a son, did your work change at all after Very your... much. Did it? The opposite of how I thought it would change. How did it change? I got more patient. He was born in 86, this painting is 87. And before that, I was much more of a conceptual painter in the sense of I had an idea, I put the idea down. After he was born, I spent more time with details, with how I painted, and the painting got more refined. You know, I put more layers of paint. I was somehow. You didn't and stop totally painting. And that totally surprised me. You didn't stop painting. Only for three weeks. I was very tired when he was first born. Only for three weeks? You've been painted continually all of your <laughs> when life? When he was first born, well. <laughs> really? I was tired, but <coughs> yeah. But then I started painting again, you know. And, and as he grows older, do your, uh, out, does your outlook change, do you think, in your work? It probably has, <coughs> you know, but it's probably because I'm growing older now. <laughs> do you think that has something to <laughs> do? It has a lot to do with it, yes. When I, I painted a, a large painting recently, it's about five by six feet, it's down in the Laguna Show, and it, I, I do a lot of paths in my paintings. I think oh, yeah. I like the journey. Uh -huh. And in this one, it's a, large, a mountain with a path going up, and the bottom half of the painting is red, is uh, green, I'm sorry, and the top half is red. And so I was sort of conceiving it originally like a conceptual piece, you know, two colored, like, you know, and, but as I painted, I got rid of the line. It got much more naturalistic. So you don't even, when you look at it, you don't notice that this is half green and half red. I see. And it goes up, and, and then I realized when I did it, oh, this is my entering middle age painting. You really felt it once yeah, you had when it finished? Yeah, I looked finished? at it once it was finished, I looked at it and I said, that's what it's, tell, you know, that's what it's about. The work gets real personal no matter where it comes from. I, and that's what it was for me. That's great. And you've been, you've brought a lot of personal insight into Astrid Preston for us today, but oh. also for ourselves to look at the way things happen. And thank you for being with oh, us. Thank you, Joan. Thanks for being with us on the Joan Quinn Profiles. And keep writing to us at 520 South Grand, 8th floor. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.